Hello and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is January 30th, 2023. And I'm very happy to have with me here today, Inez Abderazik, the executive director of the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy, PIPD. Welcome, Inez. Hello, Lara. Thank um, you for having me. We're very, I'm very happy to have you back. I'm not super happy to have you back in the current context, which is just, um, I think the most, uh, in, in many ways, the most upsetting and terrifying and worrying situation. Um, but I think something that a lot of us have been anticipating and, and it, it, there's a certain painful inevitability to where we are given a world in which Israel enjoys total impunity. Um, we're not gonna talk specifically about that today. We're here to talk today about the press. Um, my, my working title for this podcast is Eradicating Bias, Common Sense Rules for Reporting and Consuming News on Palestine. It may change when we actually publish it, but something along those lines. And, and the bottom line is, so the situation obviously on the ground is escalating. People use the word escalating and deteriorating. Um, either way, we basically have a situation where the, the, the violence on the ground in Palestine has finally broken into the mainstream headlines, notwithstanding the fact that there's been ongoing violence there for as long as anyone can remember, and certainly for the past few years, but it really only breaks through in media and social media when, when it's Israelis who are dying, Israeli Jews who are dying. And that's what's happened here. Um, there was an attack on Friday, and this is now all over the, the media, the social media. I mean, this is, this is everywhere. And, and what we're seeing here as always, and this is why I actually reached out to you to do this podcast today, is that the majority of reporting, and, and this is reporting across the board, um, it, it is, the majority of it is, is problematic, right? It is marred by what I would describe as a combination of uh, various factors that include, um, many combination of them, sometimes many of these factors, um, ignorance, um, disinterest in factual history and political context, we would call those hot takes in most contexts, um, simplistic analysis and lazy framing that tends to echo the talking points of Israeli officials and high profile pundits and advocates, key factual errors and omissions that nobody calls out. And in some cases we see more reporting that is marred by what I would view as entrenched bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious bias. And in part of that, part of that bias, I think comes from, from what we all know from our interactions with journalists is fear of being attacked if you try to tell the whole story. Um, so with that in mind, Inez, I wanna to talk to you today because your organization, PIPD, which does incredible work, I'll put a link to it in the notes that go with this podcast. Um, PIPD published a while back, a very handy guide on this very topic. Um, laying out the things that journalists should know if they're reporting on Palestine. And I want us to dig into each of these and have a little conversation around them. So if you're okay, I'm actually going to be using that document as sort of the, 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 cute, the list of questions for this podcast. So ready, set, go. So the, the, first, um, the first tip you give to journalists is contextualize your reporting. Um, I want you to talk about what you mean by contextualize your reporting. Yes, thank you, Lara. And I think what you said is, is very important first that we did not include in that guide is when, you know, when uh, the mainstream media decides to uh, report. And I think it's very clear, as you said, that it's when Israeli Jews are, are killed that suddenly we get airtime, which I think is one of the very also unconscious bias that the international media should work on. Um, when the violence against Palestinians is continuous and, and never stops. So indeed, I think contextualizing- Actually, so uh, I'm sorry, Inez, that's a really good point. So really we need to go back before one and go to point five, which is don't just jump in and, and only view it as news when Israelis die. It should be news when Palestinians die. It should be news when there are attacks on Palestinians. It, sh it shouldn't just be news when when a set of certain factors have been triggered, which say, okay, this is okay to report on, this is okay to give the headlines. That's basically what you're saying. There needs to be a 0.5 added. And I think it's it links to point one. I think contextualizing is what was the source of violence. In the end, like the violence we see now, whether you know it's uh, Palestinian resistance or else, uh, is coming from a very source of violence, which is, you know, decades-long occupation and an apartheid regime. Uh, 
uh, that I think is the source of, of triggering violence. And I think, um, you know, the fact that violence doesn't happen in a vacuum is often omitted from uh, very hard news, you know, that, that basically report on immediate uh, facts. And, you know, in our uh, context, obviously, then this is, this is another point, so I'll stop here, but, uh, you know, just basically always try and, and, and build that uh, both societism and, and try and equate, you know, whether it's Palestinians who do violence or, and this is, you know, a Palestinian who, uh, again, will be, uh, you know, one person with a gun is compared to uh, an occupying forces with a military, you know, nuclear power. So, so I think that's the very, I think the very context is is often missing, and it's uh, and it's often it's problematic because, again, we've been there. You know, uh, I'm here with you, but my dad was also, you know, an advocate for Palestinian rights, and and our grandparents also fought for uh, Palestinian rights, and and we're still here. And I think that that's a problem that I think people, the, the, the international media and, and journalists seem to write like it's something completely new again each time uh, when we know exactly what the context is. And, and then I'll get into something that we're going to talk about in a minute, which is the dehumanization of Palestinians. I think it's worth noting on the contextualizing, you mentioned your grandfather, one of the pieces, you know, we, I, in the, I live in, in the United States where we have, you know, regular mass shootings and things. And generally, the first question people ask is, well, what was the motivation? What motivated the shooter? And, and when it comes contextualizing violence um, in, in Palestine, it's generally contextualized that if Israel is doing it, it's for security, trying to keep trying to restore security, trying to in self-defense. When it comes to Palestinians, I think it's I think context, it is almost framed as if you try to give context, then you're giving an excuse for terrorism. So, for instance, if you were to ask most Americans who have been consuming news about what happened on Friday, they are unaware that the young man who carried out the shooting attack is the grandson of a Palestinian who was killed by a Jewish terrorist in 1998 in an act that was recognized by the state of Israel as an act of terrorism. And they are probably unaware that his cousin was killed, I think, the day before or two days before in an Israeli killing of a Palestinian that occurred in the context of Israel demolishing the home of a Palestinian family. And they may have heard that it came in the wake of the Janine massacre where IDF soldiers carried out a daylight operation in Janine. But every time they hear any context for the Janine massacre, they just hear, ah, as, as Dalia Hatuka tweeted, uh, yesterday, I think, you know, Janine is a cesspool of terror, right? As if there are no human beings living their lives, normal lives, who had their village invaded by the IDF. So all of that context seems like if it were in any other situation, people would care about it. You know, if it, if it, if when, when Baruch Goldstein carried out the massacre in Hebron, we learned a lot about Baruch Goldstein and his motivations as a human being. And it comes to Palestinians that to even suggest that there is context that should be taken into account is framed as um, as justifying or or rationalizing terror. So that I, I just want to add that that's my own frustration. And again, I think it starts with an uh, an unconscious bias, like an anti-Palestinian trope that we're. It's I've seen conversations online that when we try to contextualize, uh, first we're kind of accused of justifying uh, violence, and the second thing is we're only the we're the only ones who who are asked about the violence. Do you see like the Israeli government or Israeli spokesperson or or the Israelis being asked why they're using violence every day? No, I think like that's the that's the thing is again the oppressed is asked of, you know, why they're using this uh, mean. When it's not an end, it's it's a mean use, but that the very source of that violence is somewhere else. It's in the uh, in the oppressor that holds that uh, you know that source of violence. And I think this is always like what I see the way the questions are framed by international journalists is asking the oppressed to justify uh, instead of of asking the oppressor to you know about the structural violence. I don't want to stick on this one question too long. The other piece that, that occurs to me thinking about the context, and again, I live in the United States and I'm reading you know, American media and I read Jewish media. There's a very simplistic, easy contextualization that is always applied, which is this is anti-Semitism. 
right? It is, and we're going to get again to the dehumanizing Palestinians, but there's the framing which effectively says there, there is no political, historical, um, th th there's no context at all that is relevant because the only reason something like this would happen is because Palestinians have an irrational hatred of Jews. It is anti-Semitic. Everything is anti-Semitic. It is not about history or politics or anything Israel has ever done, which is an extremely convenient way to contextualize things because it means that there, there can be, to even suggest that there is any more context is to essentially be an anti-Semite. So there, there's that. Um, all right, so moving on to number two. Um, this is the issue of the passive voice, using the passive voice. And I don't, I don't know um, if that applies so much in terms of what's going on right this week, but it certainly is a constant issue. Do you wanna talk about this a little bit? Certainly, yes. Well, it's, it's uh, the fact that when Palestinians are killed by the Israeli army, often uh, a passive voice you know, is used like Palestinians died. Uh, in a in an army raid, uh, they were killed. Uh, often, also forgetting to remind who the perpetrator is. Um, when it's uh, you know Israeli Jews, like the attack in Jerusalem, it was very clear that it was. And again, the adjectives suddenly come up like this uh, terrible uh, terrorist attack. So you see a lot of the uh, not only bias but also. Uh, again, that that clear racism and dehumanization and, and, and double standards that apply, I think, were very clear also this week. Um, so I think the idea is linked to to dehumanizing Palestinian lives. Is that uh, we just end up being just uh, you know collateral damage, uh, something that uh, again, where um, the the source of violence and the structural violence that that is perpetrating that violence against Palestinians is, is almost like just secondary, um, you know, which is the Israeli uh, forces. Yeah, I, I can't remember who, somebody tweeted out in the past couple of days, a side by side of headlines. I think it was from AFP. And one headline said, Palestinian kills um, six Jewish Israelis in shooting in Jerusalem or something. And the other one side by side said, you know, 10 Palestinians die in Operation in Janine. I mean, it was like very, very blatant um, who, 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 who counts as a human being and who counts as an actor in this space. Um, it, is, it, it, is a, it is a constant difficulty, I think, for journalists to, to try to figure out how to, how to accurately lay out the facts. And I think they tend, we've seen this over and over, they tend in their language, we see this, the, the passive voice, which turns Palestinians into less than people and takes agency away from Israel in taking responsibility for killing them. So it works both ways. I think that's, that's, that's clear. So let's get to the big one on this one, which is the dehumanizing Palestinians. This is number three on your list. Do not dehumanize Palestinians. So we've already touched on this a little bit. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Yes, well, first, I think, again, the media complete disinterest when, uh, you know, a Palestinian home is being demolished, when, um, I don't know, a farmer loses all of his olive trees because of, you know, army bulldozers or settler attack. All of these stories, you know, get lost uh, because the mainstream media just reports, you know, if, uh, again, we're like a large number, like if, if we are mourning more than 40 people, then suddenly it becomes news. But before that, uh, you know, we're not reported, uh, you know, we're just not of interest. And so that's terrible because then we are kind of put in that position of, of having to highlight being numbers, which is terrible. And, um, you know, I just was on BBC Saturday night and it was very clear, like the whole reporting was about uh, the fact that the, I think the some of the uh, Jerusalem, um, you know, people who were uh, attacked or, or who were killed, there was uh, stories about, you know, one being a, a mother and one being a, I, I can't remember, it was, it was their stories. And then the reporter went into saying, you know, oh, by the way, like 30 Palestinians also were killed. And, and then she got mad at me because I told her, you know, you are clearly not telling that there was also a mother and everyone has a story. Everyone is a, a father, a brother, uh, everyone, you know, these families have their uh, lives completely broken, and and that's not 
being re reported on. And, and so we become just numbers. And this is really uh, extremely uh, dangerous because again, you know, that's part of also the, uh, I think Israeli disinformation is to make us just uh, being seen as just either terrorists or uh, anti-Semites or just a, a, a kind of this mass uh, of people who who just don't matter, who don't have a, yeah, who just, you know, don't know how to love or don't have a life or, you know, in mourning. Yeah, I, I, two things I want to add to that, which is one is the, you talked earlier about the systematic violence, systemic violence. I think the systemic dehumanization is important. And I think it's important, right, for this, for this piece of it, because it's obvious when it comes down to, okay, when someone dies, do they get a name or not? Do they count? But it includes things like when someone has their home demolished. I mean, when settlers face being moved out of their homes, it's news. I mean, the idea that people would actually be torn from their homes, lose their, you, you, there's a human interest side of it. On Palestinians, there's never a human interest side. And, and to the extent that Palestinians are, are, are killed, there is likewise the framing where that, I, I don't even know how to articulate it. It's, it's, so, it's so inhumane when you effectively have the argument, well, when Palestinians die, it is, it is the fault of them for being Palestinian effectively, right? It's because of Hamas, or it's because of the PA, it's because of the politics, as if the human beings themselves don't count. They've got, because you have this political dynamic, they don't count and there's no responsibility for killing them or for taking their homes or for ruining their lives. I mean, this is uh, the number of conversations I've had with people trying to explain why the Palestinian issue of prisoners is so important. I try to say, try to imagine that every family you knew had people who were in prison for essentially trying to live their lives or for anything more, whatever it is, this, be, this, is, this is your family. It's gonna define your existence. And it's essentially treated as a footnote that is, is so, it is so accepted that Palestinians, that their lives are defined by being dehumanized, that it's not even news. And it doesn't even figure into framing when Israel starts meeting out collective punishment, for example, as we're seeing now, which I think we're gonna get into in a moment. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, I think there is clearly underlying racism and I think it's beyond also Palestinians, to be honest. I think it was Noura Arafat who said, I think at some point last year or two years ago, you know, it's it's almost like we're we're Arabs. We're expected to die. You know, we're also in this. Uh, I think in the Western mind, like you know, because we're in the Middle East, if that's a thing, or like you know, Arabs, uh, somehow it would be more normal because we're brown, because we're uh, Arabs. Just that that we die. It's just something that it seems as something that would be more normal in our side of the world, which is completely insane. Um, and so, and I think it's part of that uh, dynamic as well. Yeah, I, I recall some years ago, I was on Capitol Hill and a member of Congress was talking about, there had been, I don't remember which, there had been an attack and a lot of Jewish Israelis had died. And they framed it as this was the equivalent of X number of 9-11s for Israel. And they effectively framed it as if, it, the, the framing was set up that there are fewer Israelis and fewer Jews in the world. So effectively every life is worth more because percentage wise, there's fewer of us in the world. It was the most stunning and, 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 and dehumanizing framing. And I say this as a Jewish person who is acutely aware of, of the, 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 the things that have been done to my people across generations, the framing that somehow a Jewish life is more valuable than an Arab life because there are fewer of us and we've been more targeted across history as if every human life is not equally valuable, whether you believe in the eyes of God or the eyes of law or whatever, it was just, I, I still actually haven't quite gotten over that, that, that moment. And I've seen it other places. Um, I wanna get down to the next one, which is the misleading and inaccurate terminology. And I think this is really right at the core of everything we're talking about. Do you wanna, you wanna go into this a little bit? Yes, so what we see when we when we wrote this point, we're thinking about term terminology that's used like uh, clashes, uh, confrontation, riots. Um, and, and, and this is very much building into that false narrative and discourse that there would be just two sides, uh, you know, that would be in dispute, that would be in conflict be, and, you know, as equal parties. Uh, this again erases the context that there is an occupier and an occupied, 
uh, that Israel has the control over Palestinian life, uh, that Palestinians live under uh, discriminatory racist rules, uh, they live under a military regime or as second class citizens, that they are basically just at the mercy of a, you know, of a racist regime. And, and the problem with that is again, that I think um, there is, it builds that false, I think idea that there is equal responsibilities. And it plays in different situations, whether it's last week or before, like when uh, we're talking about like young, you know, young Palestinians who would just take a few stones and throw them at the army, um, when the army is invading illegally the territory where uh, you know Palestinians live, so suddenly it's it's clashes or it riots. No, it's actually Palestinians who don't want military tanks and jeeps invading their homes and space. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think this is really something that we, we keep seeing. And part of also that terminology that we discussed before is also about cycle of violence or, you know, it's, there is no cycle. Uh, it's, it's continuous. The violence is continuous. It's just that, again, um, I think when uh, international politicians, uh, and we see it with all of the administrations in the West, are calling for de-escalation of violence, for you know, all sides to de-escalate. That also gives the idea that again, it's just two parties, you know, um, just uh, face to face with each other. And the fact that uh, calm would go back in the Israeli side, um, you know, would mean that suddenly it's peaceful. No, it's it's just that the violence is only then felt by the Palestinians. Yeah, I think that last point. It always strikes me whenever I see an analysis that talks about like a period of quiet being broken, a period of calm being broken, or the stability being undermined. And I always wonder what the journalist is thinking when they use words like quiet and calm and stability, because effectively what they mean, they, whether they know it or not, is this means that Israelis are feeling comfortable. It has nothing to do with whether or not there's ongoing systemic violence being meted out against Palestinians every single day as long as that violence is not in somehow boiling over and affecting the lives of Israelis, particularly Israelis inside the green line, then we call it quiet and calm and stable. I also just wanna throw out the terms like security operation, um, which is a very neutral term, um, which I'm not sure Americans, American readers are always even American or international readers or even journalists understand. The uh, security operation is a very neutral term for an aggressive operation by military in a civilian area in the West Bank or Gaza, right? This is going into people's homes, it's going into people's villages. And as you said, people in any way resisting is then framed as terrorism. You also have really fascinating Israeli language, which I think is being adopted by other illiberal regimes or maybe borrowed from them with terms like neutralize. You neutralize your opponents. So someone is accused of throwing a Molotov cocktail, he is neutralized. That means that he is shot and killed on the spot. There's no trial, there's no arrest, it's, it's, it's execution. But neutralize is a very you know, neutral sounding term when you're dealing with a quote unquote terrorist, including, you know, we've seen on we've seen videos. We saw the the video of the young man who had you know, was carrying what turned out to be a dummy weapon, dropped it, ran, and then was neutralized while running, who was the cousin, I believe, of the young man who carried out the attack um, in the Jerusalem settlement on Friday. Um, all right, let's go to the next one, um, which is about language and framing that adopts an immediate presumption of guilt, even written unconsciously, it, it, dumps a it adopts a presumption of guilt of Palestinians before even telling the story. You want to jump into that one? Yeah, I think that speaks to itself. Uh, you know, again, the idea that uh, we are automatically either uh, militants or terrorists or anti-Semites. Uh, and I think it plays into, obviously, Israel disinformation, right? That, again, they're trying to portray any Palestinian who's fighting for their rights, who's fighting for their lives as, as, a, um, as a villain. Um, yeah. And I think it, it unfortunately, uh, works with mainstream media. And the other thing is also that um, I think it's it's the gaslighting you were talking about, that again, we're sort of, um, I think we've por we're portrayed as uh, guilty of the, the violence perpetrated against us. But that's that's the definition of gaslighting, right? The reverse, uh, reversing the victim, 
um, I think pattern. And uh, and I think this is this is also very clear in the in, in the media and you know formulas like I think uh, when a Palestinian says something, um, you know, often we're either just uh, testimonies, uh, you know, uh, not an analysis or an expertise. We're just like bypassers, a former or something that, you know, will give just, uh, you know, an emotional account of something uh, without being very clear of, of what the situation is. Uh, and, and, and so where next to like a, an Israeli expert or an Israeli official voice. And uh, I think the Palestinians, you know, when they are quoted or commenting on something, often there is like Palestinians claim to, right? Like a, a, a Palestinian claim claiming that um, there's always that caveat that it's often much more present in front or behind a Palestinian voice than an Israeli voice. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've gone back and forth with the journalists on this in the past where you have, you know, an Israeli official said, Palestinians claimed, alleged. I'm like, you, you do realize that with your, just simply your, your verb choice is stating who, whom, you, whom you think is credible. And maybe you mean that. Maybe that is a, a deliberate bias, um, but it is it is a very it, for people consuming news. I think it's the sort of thing maybe a consumer isn't even aware of as they're reading, but they come away with a clear sense of who is believable and who isn't. I, I'd also just add, and you 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 reference you sort of what reference this briefly. This whole question of what how you, the language that Israel uses to address Palestinians interacting with IDF troops inside their own village, on their streets. These are not, I think if you were to ask a lot of people in the international community, they would be under the impression that Palestinians are taking guns and going into the streets of Tel Aviv and Beersheba all the time and shooting up, that that's what this is, as opposed to the IDF coming in, rolling in with you know fully armored vehicles and fully armored people and having rocks thrown at them or maybe getting shot at. It is not under international law terrorism to, to, to carry out attacks against an army. You can argue that it is wrong. You can say it's bad. You can say it's self. However you feel about armed resistance, that's your business. But it isn't terrorism, right? That isn't, it's, these, are, these are armed forces. Going after civilians is when it becomes terrorism. But Israel has a framing which has largely been adopted by the international community that Israeli civilians are civilians and Israeli soldiers are civilians and all Palestinians are presumptively terrorists, period. And it's been an incredibly effective framing, um, which I think, again, I think readers are unconsciously taken in by it when they read the news and, and I don't think media sufficiently challenge it. Um, yeah, war crimes completely normalized. I mean, when you think about it, you know, again, talking about raids, uh, that euphemisms, right, about that that the the, the Western media is using, um, I think is is has normalized what effectively are war crimes or crimes against humanity um, in our context. Um, indeed, it has been completely trivialized. Yeah, what is also a little bit surreal, I think, for all of us who work on this issue in depth, is that of all the conflicts in the world, this is a conflict where the facts of what Israel is doing are probably the best documented, <laughs> including by Israeli human rights groups. It, it is not merely an allegation that Israel is carrying out raids in Palestinian villages. It is not merely an allegation that they are shooting tear gas into people's houses. It is not merely an allegation that they're dragging children out of their houses and photographing them and arresting them at night. This is all documented. And yet it's still framed as an operation is taken as at all times legitimate, even though you've got a group like Breaking the Silence, which is a group of Israeli demobilized soldiers, explaining that not only are many of these operations not legitimate under international law, they're not even framed internally as anything except operations meant to show who's boss, right? So you've got all of this documented. And yet this framing, of Israel always doing something for legitimate and correct and legal reasons. And any Palestinian resistance, even directly in front of their home, own home, is terrorism, is, is largely accepted and echoed in the media, um, which goes directly into the next one. Let's talk about this, which is the, the, the issue of taking Israeli official statements at face value. You wanna, wanna take that one on? Yes, I mean, we talked about gaslighting Palestinian, you know, voices and accounts. I think it's very clear that unfortunately, 
let's face it, the, um, I know how the Israeli army and system works when it comes to informing journalists. They're extremely um, fast at uh, sharing any kinds of disinformation information, you know, after something happens, which means that they preempt um, other, you know, Palestinians uh, information about the same event. So because, again, there is this idea that there is an official body, they have a government press office, they have, uh, you know, a full like bureaucracy, uh, you know, informing the media. Um, this is seen as more legit than, for some reason, you know, a people uh, fighting for its liberation and, and its survival under that particular occupation. So the problem is that then Israeli authorities are seen as a good faith actor when repeatedly, again and again, they are lying. They are spreading this information. We saw this this week. I, I saw how quickly it spread, you know, the fact that the attack in Jerusalem was uh, next to a synagogue. It had nothing to do, you know, the synagogue was not targeted. It was not because, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was not inside the synagogue. It was not just outside. It was not worshipers who were attacked. It happened to be in a street where there was a lot of people and, and next to a synagogue. But, you know, the fact that then it was turned into Israeli disinformation and propaganda that uh, so that they would portray, uh, I think, uh, Palestinians as bloody, you know, bloodthirst anti-Semites. And I think this is um, this is very serious. And the same happened with Shirin Abu Akleh last year. We saw it, you know, by the book last year when Shirin was killed. First, they said, oh, it's a Palestinian who did it and then unroll their usual disinformation playbook. That disinformation has patterns, and we see them repeatedly over and over again. Unfortunately, I see a lot of reporters who still take Israel's official information and that the discourse built around it as accurate. And this is very serious because then it builds that kind of racist uh, you know, discourse and narrative that doubts in the, in the heads of people. Yeah, I, I was thinking about Shirin as well. I was also thinking about the the Palestinian man who was killed at a what is called a flying checkpoint. These are checkpoints that are for fo folks who don't know the terminology. These are checkpoints that Israel sets up on short notice in places people don't expect there to be checkpoints, and then end up there's often incidents at them because people don't know the checkpoint there. In this case, you had a checkpoint that was set up, and it ended up with a long line of cars. People honked their horns. Eventually, Israel fired a a a um, stun grenade, I guess, some kind of grenade, not an explosive one, a noise one, which hit somebody's car. The guy and his son in the car yelled and complained. Eventually, the guy is dragged out of his car and he ends up shot in the neck. And that was initially framed as a terrorist. And it took a few days before Israel basically admitted he shouldn't have been killed. But by that time, the, the news cycle had moved on, right? The other piece going, to, and I'm, I, I'd like you to, if you want to comment on this, the issue of the Israeli statements I think is really important because it isn't just the statements giving disinformation about what happened. And, and I would argue looking at Shirin, you have a textbook um, example of what it looks like to try to make sure that even if you have to take responsibility, the news cycle is long past by the time you do. So that's that angle of disinformation. But you also have the disinformation of, for instance, the Israeli cabinet coming up with what it says are a list of responses to a terror attack in Jerusalem. And that list of responses effectively is a list of things they already do, but they're now going to do even more of and even more viciously against innocent civilians framed as a specific, I think, I think Bibi used the word precise punishment. So in response to the shooting in Jerusalem, you're going to see you know, home, the home, the demolition of the home of the family of the guy who, kill, uh, who carried out the attack. Well, but Israel has been doing that for a long time. That's not new. This is Israel reasserting its right to commit collective punishment, to punish innocent people for the crimes of their family, which is illegal under international law, and it's utterly immoral by any normal standard. They are going to double down on settlements, which they're going to do anyway. This Israeli government has made clear that it believes that Israel has a, an, an inalienable and exclusive right to all of the land. It's This is basically saying, now we have an excuse to do what we're gonna do anyway. And then there's a whole, the whole list, everything they lay out, it's, it's actually framed over and over in the media as this is Israel's response to the attack, as if they weren't doing all of this anyway. 
but now they've got an excuse and, an, and a, a rationale for why no one can criticize them because they're doing it now as a response to terror. So that's, uh, I would just throw that in. And if you have anything on, on that you want to add. No, I just wanted to conclude on, on I think on, on that point. Um, yeah, I lost myself. So let's move to the next point, it's fine. So the next point I think is in some ways the most important for this conversation, which is center Palestinian voices and narratives. Do you, do you talk about that? Yeah, well, I think it's also pretty straightforward. I think the, as I said before, I think, you know, any reporting or, or interviews that concern Palestine or Israel uh, need to center the people experiencing the reality and our best place to describe it. Um, so, I mean, you know, for people who hear it, it's like if you would report on domestic violence, uh, you know, the phenomenon or feminicides and not invite women. Uh, often I've seen, again, in the past few days, uh, you have TV sets where there's no Palestinians. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, white uh, historians, uh, you know, Israelis, uh, Jewish voices, but where are the Palestinians? So the space, that space must be given to Palestinians. Again, not only as just testimonies or uh, just a, uh, you know, a quote of like, how you feeling, but also Palestinians to give you know, their, uh, their analysis on things and, and their expertise. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not naive as well. Like obviously uh, there can be bad Palestinian voices. Uh, I think that just in, can be feel like an injunction to just like invite a Palestinian and uh, it might not be the right person. I'm just saying that among the Palestinians who live that reality, there's a lot of, uh, you know, just people who deserve to be heard and, and should be heard. Um, and, the, and I think the last point there is um, too often and still, uh, we are only validated when there is an Israeli next to us. Um, so often I have to refuse interviews because I refuse to be, you know, why do I need uh, an Israeli next to me? First, it creates that, again, false equivalence. And second, I don't need my, um, my analysis to be validated uh, next to an Israeli voice. And, and often, uh, you know, that, uh, that false dichotomy, that false, uh, you know, equidistancing is, is created and it's, um, it's bad. Yeah, I, I have to say that the media has a responsibility here. I mean, this is something that that is just so clear because it's not merely not allowing Palestinians to be part of the discussion of their own their own their own lives, but the the act of not centering Palestinian experts, and I'm saying here as experts, people like you in a discussion of what is happening, directly invalidates. Palestinians as experts. The media is playing a role in invalidating and in, in delegitimizing Palestinians as voices, as experts in their own experience and on the issues that they that they focus on more than anyone because it's it's their experience. And that is, I think, it's it's indefensible. Um, and I would hope that for people who are consuming news, that they ask themselves when they see a report dealing with Palestine and they don't see Palestine voices at the center of this report. I hope they ask themselves why that is the case. If there was a, a report on Black Lives Matters or, 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 I mean, you would ask yourself, why are the people who are not involved, who spent years studying this and experiencing this and are closest to it, why are they not talking about it? And nobody would tolerate this. Again, I will say this is a Jewish American. If there was a discussion of, you know, anti-Semitism rising in the U.S. that didn't involve Jews. It's all right. This is whether I agree with them or every single Jewish person's analysis of anti-Semitism or not to not involve Jewish people in a discussion of something that is so fundamental to their lives would be absurd. And no one would ever think that you would do it. So that's that's critical. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, like just like you don't ask any Jewish person you invite on a certain on topic of anti-Semitism to represent all Jews, because that can happen. Right. I don't like if we speak, if you invite a Palestinian to speak, don't expect them to speak for all Palestinians, but they can give a certain perspective. And I think it's it's very important. And again, I think it speaks to uh, the, the problem of the media when it comes to Palestine um, in this, um, I think this ultimate um, um, objective that they want for themselves to be neutral. But you cannot be neutral. It's like saying you would be neutral in this again in the face of domestic violence. 
you're trying to have a neutral approach when it comes to uh, racism against black people. I mean, come on, um, you know, you cannot be neutral. And I think that again is part of the Israeli disinformation is they are, um, I think, trying to build into any discourse and narrative that this is a both sides issue and that therefore if you're uh, you know, neutral and you put kind of the dots just in, the, in that very equi equi equilibrium between Israelis and Palestinians, then you're doing things right. Uh, it's not the case. Uh, and I think you can be neutral if you do good reporting uh, when it comes to, you know, a place that is colonized and under occupation. Yeah, I, I would say it's not even about not being neutral. It is a false idea of neutrality. It is a false idea of neutrality to give a manufactured symmetry between the oppressed and the oppressor. And I, 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 it, it, is, it is a fundamental misframing that I think is present in almost all coverage on Palestine and, and is, is fundamentally um, something that has to be challenged and, and that's what you're doing and I'm grateful for that. All right, we have a couple more points, um, three more points. The next one is, um, as framed in your, in your report, it's about Gaza and Hamas, but I think it's broader. I, I would say it's about not, re it's not reducing people to simply being tools of political parties. Um, do you wanna talk about that for a second? Yeah, so in that point, in, indeed, we framed it as because often on, on Gaza, instead of speaking about you know Gaza, the fact that it's 2 million people, they're under blockade, uh, the phrase often comes that it's Hamas controlled Gaza. I mean, like it, 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 it would be defining Gaza and Gazans. Um, and so I think, again, this is uh, part of the dehumanizing, part of the, uh, the smearing. Um, and just like you said uh, before about Janine, like, right, calling it a cesspool of terrorists. And so suddenly uh, you have people who've been trapped as refugees for more than 75 years and forced to be refugees out of their homeland that suddenly are completely dehumanized and, uh, you know, just defined um, wrongfully. Uh, through uh, you know a political faction or another, this is this is part of the dehumanizing, and so it's again it's very important, uh, I think, to uh, make sure that uh, you know you're um, if you're a journalist avoiding that. Yeah, and I mean it's it's you you see this even with things like Janine with like the theater. Janine is famous for its theater, and it ends. This is a long story; people can look it up themselves. But the theater and the culture around that theater it then becomes, becomes framed as a terrorist theater. Everything is terrorism, right? Everything is terrorism. Everything associated with the people is terrorist. Um, by the way, going back, I forgot on the issue of what comes out of um, Israeli officials' mouths. I think it's worth remembering that I think it was last week, the Israeli ambassador to the UN once again called Palestinians seeking, um, seeking help from the UN and active terrorism. That, that was before what happened on Friday. So it was already an act of terrorism to go to the UN. Um, sorry, catching back up to where we are now. Let's go back um, to the list. So we have two more. Um, this one I think is really important. I've reframed it a little bit. I call it rejecting the fragmentation of the Palestinian people. Um, the word fragmentation has been on my mind a lot. I've been listening to my Palestinian colleagues. Do you want to talk about what you mean by that? Yes. Um, unfortunately, you know, because uh, Israeli settler colonialism and, and occupation has fragmented us in different sets of hierarchized reality. Uh, so, you know, when you're in Jerusalem, when you're in the West Bank, when you're in Gaza, you have, you know, effectively now different um, ID numbers, different, uh, different type of ideas, different uh, lives. You live under different circumstances of Israeli control and discrimination. That, had, that is imposed fragmentation on the Palestinians. What that translates into is that um, when, it, when things are happening, often, um, again, the mainstream media will look into, will just zoom in. And so um, first, obviously, forget to contextualize, as we discussed. But that means that people will just hear about Janine for you know, this period. And then they will just hear about Gaza. And then they will just hear about Sheikh Jarrah. The problem with that is that it's the same reality. We are one people fighting, uh, you know, years and years of dispossession, of denial of self determination, um, you know, a military regime crashing our people. It's the same struggle. It's the same fight. It's the same reality. But they have done, uh, you know, they have built in that uh, divide and rule uh, mechanism so that uh, effectively. Externally, it looks like very different realities. And so it means that it's very complicated then for people to understand. 
you know, that leads to people thinking, oh, it's so complicated and, and where is this and what about Gaza and what about where is Jenin and where is Sheikh Jarrah? Um, I think that's also part of, uh, you know, putting confusion in the mind of people and, um, and forgetting that, again, we are one people and we're having the same national struggle. Ines, can you just talk briefly about the unity intifada and what, what we saw with the, the engagements of Palestinians across all of Palestine, including inside the Green Line, um, which I remember at the time was people were going, wow, what's happening? And Palestinians are going like, yes, this is happening. Yeah. I mean, yes, I think it was one of these moments where Palestinians rose uh, up. They went into the streets and protested. Uh, in all of the different geographies where Palestinians are, including in the diaspora and outside Palestine, because Palestinians also exist, you know, uh, in exile. And so I think it's, um, it, it's very important when we, you know, all have the same, you know, uh, energy to rise up. Unfortunately, you know, uh, I think at times, like, the repression is so heavy that uh, obviously Israel, again, has this uh, such a, a crashing military control that I think these moments are, uh, you know, have not been uh, seen enough. But indeed, I think it's always important to look from the river to the sea that there is one territory, there is a reality of one regime controlling a, a people. And Palestinians exist also in Haifa, in Yaffa. You know, the Palestinian culture and the Palestinian identity exist in overall territory. And it's extremely important that also, again, media contextualize that and do not reduce us to being one refugee camp or, you know, one, um, you know, strip under blockade, because that is part of the dehumanizing and also part of really misleading the political analysis and the political understanding of what's happening. And I would just add, you, you said river to the sea, which I know is a trigger for some people. I think it's worth noting that the current Israeli government and most of the previous Israeli government and most of the Israeli body politic today functions in either a de facto or an absolute unapologetic official view, which says from the river to the sea is, as Bibi said, inalienably and exclusively Israel's. Um, there is absolutely that framing that this is one territory. Um, and you see this with Israel banning the the PLO, the, the Palestinian flag, right? They're, Palest they're banning it everywhere. And the idea there is the, trying to push back against what they recognize is a coherent Palestinian identity, no matter how hard they've tried to fragment it. Um, so th this is th this is not um, this is not something that Israel would disagree with. They would just see a different outcome or many Israelis would disagree with, but they would see a different outcome or hope for a different outcome. Um, all right, last thing. Um, and then I wanna ask you a final wrap up question. This is the issue of self-censorship and, and the, the watchdogs like camera and, and uh, there's a whole group of them out there. Do you wanna talk about how, how, how the media should deal with the um, constant efforts they face when they do try to tell the story a little bit more completely? Yes. Um, look, I feel for journalists too. I know how these watchdogs uh, work. So the moment you write an article that's actually pretty fair, pretty ethical, uh, pretty well written, you automatically have you know Israeli watchdogs coming after you, and it's it's uh, it's scary. It's intimidating. They go to your editor. You know, sometimes it's freelance journalists who can lose their contracts. Um, so they have very. Um, I wouldn't say. I'm not sure if it's effective. But they have very scary methods of harassing and, and kind of, again, gaslighting and, uh, and smearing uh, journalists. Uh, so, and I think it's, it, obviously it works often in, in, in some cases and we see it. So uh, whether it's, it's not only journalists, right? It's, it can be, um, you know, it can lead to conferences being, um, being canceled. It can lead to journalists being fired. Uh, it leads to, uh, articles being changed online and edited just right after an Israeli watchdog will will go after them. So you know, our obviously our advice is you know you you know we have lists. You know you know who they are. We know some of these organizations. Uh, you know which they are. So don't take them uh, seriously and try to push back against. And and I've seen to be honest, editorials doing that uh, in the you know in the background in the back scenes, not publicly. Um, I think it's it's seen. I think some of them are clearly 
uh, you know, uh, obviously it's annoying for for media. You know, you want to have you know freedom of the press and, and freedom to report as as you want. So I think it's the idea of you know just encouraging the media not to be intimidated by those. Uh, and actually, they're more powerful. You know, a media is more powerful than these watchdogs. At the end, what can they do? Um, and I think it's uh, you know obviously they use lawfare, and you're you're much more versed into that. Uh, uh, area than me, but you know they can go into liberal suits, etc. But often, uh, actually, they're completely uh, lost or dismissed, like we've seen in Germany, for instance. So I, I, would, I thank you. That was that's very clear. I, I would also say for the, the focus of for this podcast, the you know for for people who are reading and watching media, you know, so I think for a lot of journalists, and I, I, I think there's really good journalists trying to do good work, and I agree with you. It's I, I feel for them. At this point, there is a perception that if you get things wrong in a way that is friendly to Israel, there's no cost. Like in this most recent attack on Friday, referring to it as a synagogue attack, it wasn't. Referring as, 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 as an attack in Jerusalem, as opposed to in a settlement in East Jerusalem built on Palestinian land. You know, there, there's no cost to getting those facts wrong or not exactly right, but there's a sense that there is a cost if you try to report them well. And, and some of that comes back to the readers and the, the consumers of media, which is the question of whether consumers of media push back and say, wait a minute, this isn't accurate. Wait a minute, why are we not hearing Palestinian voices here? Wait a minute, why are you quoting without question the statements of the Israeli government without giving the context that this is illegal under international law because it's collect, you know, there, there's a role here for, for the consumers of media as well. And I guess, like as a as a final question, we've run long here. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on on what you you hope people who are consumers of media um, learn from the same list. You know what where where they can be more engaged or what they should be looking for to understand whether they're reading good reporting or watching a good reporting piece on TV. Yeah, I think holding uh, the media accountable is extremely important. Um... You know, I, I, I've, I've heard from journalists uh, telling me, you know, you should do the same as watchdogs. I'm like, no, I mean, we're not bad faith actors first, we're good faith. So what we want to provide is, is um, you know, good advice and constructive feedback. And so when you see uh, a reporting that you feel is of bad faith, is inaccurate, is dehumanizing Palestinians, is against these guidelines, then yes, hold the media accountable. The journalists take it to the social media. Again, I'm not. I'm, I'm against smearing and harassment, but I'm definitely for publicly holding accountable someone who writes publicly. And so, whether it's through readers' letters, newsletters, the social media, um, I think it's important. Um, so that I think uh, you know, because that's how also we got. Uh, to be fair, we got some victories and and wins and and being seen as Palestinians when you know we're a collective of us individually just trying to hold accountable inaccuracies and and uh, and wrong facts all right well listen i want to thank you we're going to stop there i've taken much more of your time than i meant to um i am so grateful for the work that you do for pipd you also work with shabaka and you also work with build palestine wonderful organizations i'll put links to all of those in the notes from here so grateful and and this is a difficult time and i it's always a difficult time but this is a particularly difficult time so i really appreciate how much time you gave us so thank you um thank you and i want to thank our listeners for tuning into this episode of occupied thoughts i apologize that it ran long but it's a lot to cover um please make sure to check out the fmep website www.fmep.org for more content on all of these issues we touched on today um, again, check out the PIPD website, um, follow Inez on Twitter. I will put links to all of that into the notes. Um, and as always, I'd encourage you to subscribe to this podcast so you can stay up to date. We're doing a ton of podcasts. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify, and you can watch videos of these podcasts on YouTube. So with that, I'm signing off until the next episode of FMEP's Occupied Thoughts.